Um, I'm just going to talk about some neuromuscular. You can't, you know, talk about them all. Um, the sort of the most common cerebral palsy and spina bifida, and the muscular part, sort of the um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, is the prototype. Um, I'll give a few words about Marfan and neurofibromatosis type one specifically because type two doesn't really scoliosis doesn't feature um, in that. Um, you've seen this before. When you're evaluating, I'm not going to talk about the physical exam, but we'll talk about sort of the imaging things. Um, flexibility to me is, is key. Um, and it's key not only in deciding front and back, but also deciding when to operate. Because a lot of times these patients come early um, to you, you know, in the first decade, and you try, I'm trying to find an excuse not to operate on them. Um, and so increasingly I'm operating on the unloaded um, spine or the sort of traction film and not on the, not on the, just the typical upright. Um, MRI, um, these are some of the things that we look for. Um, CT scan, and I'll get back to this with the neural um, issues with the MRI. The CT scan for me is a surgical planning um, device, as you've seen lots of uh, CT scans um, with you know, vertebral anomalies, that look at, look at the, the, the kyphosis better, that kind of thing. Um, the natural history is different from idiopathic, as you can see there. The onset tends to be earlier. Um, the progression is more, is more um, inexorable. Um, Non-optimal management, really, there's not much of a role except to delay. <clears throat> and even delay, I think delay suggests that you're influencing natural history. I don't think you are. I think you're just covering it up. Um, and you're making yourself feel like you're doing something um, because you don't want to operate. Um, and then finally, the probability of operation is, is higher, I think, with the neuromusculars in general. Um, I think it's important to think of the neuromuscles in sort of, in a, in a sense, of disease burden. Um, the greater the involvement um, in these syndromes or these conditions, the more likely there is to, to be um, spinal deformity. Um, another important thing is cognition. I think the, the greater the cognition, the less, because it's part of disease burden, um, and vice versa, the more the, the, the plegia, the more the hydrocephalus, um, the less the cognition, and usually the, the worse the spine deformity. <coughs> Um, for, um, for Duchenne, they have a very typical um, um, sort of profile. Their diagnosis is on average about four years of age. They're in a wheelchair by 10, and that's about when the scoliosis um, um, sets in. And many would say, you know, they have a limited um, lifespan. Just once you see the scoliosis, just go ahead and, and take care of it um, so that you give them as much um, of the remainder of their remainder of their life as possible um, in the best um, in the best um, position, and the lifespan is about thirty ish. The literature is variable, and everyone's got a story of someone who's older, but that's about what they're looking at. Um, for neurofibromatosis and muscular dystrophy, remember that all these patients can be sort of normal. At least the spectrum is is large, especially for the muscular dystrophy. It's not all Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's Becker. It's others, um, and a lot of the patients are quite mild and really quite uninvolved, and. Um, nothing more so than Marfan, <clears throat> and um, you know there, there's a large um, um, proportion of Marfan patients who essentially are normal. They're just tall, you know. There's the super, you know, super Marfan um, type, um, you know. And whether you think that Abraham Lincoln had Marfan syndrome, that's debatable. Um, the same thing for Osama bin Laden. Um, he's six foot six, and he sees a heart a heart specialist, and so on and so forth. Um, for spina bifida, again. The, it's all based on the level. As the level goes up, the amount of scoliosis goes up, and the number of times you have to operate on it um, goes up. Um, for CP, likewise, the more they're involved, um, the more likely they are to have scoliosis. The hemiplegics very rarely have um, scoliosis. And that's just not for scoliosis, that's for their hip dysplasia and for their other issues. So on to special considerations. We'll get back to the neural things, and I, I showed this slide for, the, for MRI. Um, Chiari, you know, it's, it's type 2 for the spina bifida patients, um, and the approach is decompression. Um, hydrocephalus um, gets shunted. Um, whether that influences their cognition and what have you, I think is debatable, probably doesn't. Um, if they have a cavity, whether it's a syrinx or a hydromyelia, um, you know, do, the, the question of whether you drain it, I think that's um, somewhat debatable, but certainly if they have pain or, or decreasing neural function, people would intervene. Whether you influence, and Dr. Song asked about this earlier, whether you influence um, um, scoliosis and curve progression, I think really sort of depends on who you ask. Um, Diastomatomyelia, I would, um, our literature I think is pretty clear that sort of, you know, cool your jets with this, do it if there's a neural change, but otherwise, just because it's there, don't necessarily intervene. There's an, an, a, a study from DuPont that showed a fair, uh, fairly high complication rate with, with releasing these. Um, tethered cord, I think, is a little bit different. Most people want to get in and do something about a tethered cord. But we, again, in, our, in, in the orthopedic literature, we have, um, we have at least one 
study that sort of suggests that it really doesn't make a difference to these patients. They still have orthopedic operations, and they still have um, recurrence. Um, and so what are we really doing? And at our place in San Francisco, we try to do it only if we absolutely have to. Um, Duralectasia and neurofibromas, that's what I was talking about in the, in the earlier um, talk. These can be really a challenge surgically. The above um, image is a Marfan patient that we <coughs> operated on recently. You know, and everywhere you turn, these things are just ballooning out, um, and it's a real fixation um, challenge. And the same thing for the, these big neurofibromas down the bottom right. This, this man is just completely peppered with it, um, and everywhere you turn, he's got these big bulbous uh, neurofibromas. Um, the, you know, go in the front, they're all over the place. Go in the back, they're all over the place. Um, and you can see at his apex, there's a large neurofibroma. It's hard to see, but it's this whole, this whole thing is sort of eroding his um, um, vertebral bodies. Nutrition is, it looms large um, in all the neuromusculars, and these are three guidelines that, that are popularly used, and you try to get your patients above um, this before you um, attack them. Um, urinary, same thing. You just assume that they're all infected. The clean um, cath um, regimens have become a big help for spinal bifida. This is old news now, um, but be before this, it was, it was, it was, I mean, the morbidity of, of UTI and the death from, 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 from sepsis was significant in those patients. And they get worked up every six to 12 months, um, and they all get covered because you assume they're all infected. Same with latex allergy, you just assume that everyone's latex allergic. Some people talk about antioperative testing. I don't think that's um, really necessary. Um, it's about a 25% rate, but we just you know, treat them all the same. And we try to make it the first case of the day so that you don't have aerosolized um, latex from your previous operation. Um, hip dysplasia, um, this came up for the adult world. Um, for the neuromusculars, because the pelvis often is part of your reconstruction, I think perhaps you can think of this in the, in the reverse. Um, most people would take care of the spine problem and then deal with the hip problem if necessary. Um, and that's a simple algorithm down below, for, at least for, for me. Um, if, they, if they walk, you know, you do everything, full court press. If they don't walk, then really it's a matter of if they're painful. If they're not painful, just leave it alone. And if they are painful, that's debatable. I just do resection, but some would reconstruct. Um, but anyway, I would I approach these first with the spine, get that all organized, because that is going to influence the pelvis um, position, and then see what, what you have left over um, and deal with it then. I also agree that it's never so it's never an urgent issue that you have to deal with it right away. You, these, these are slow moving targets and you have plenty of time to plan. Um, hemorrhage, it's a big problem for, the, for, for these patients. Um, these are some sort of the issues. Um, these are long operations, the exposures are large and the reserve, we're talking about pulmonary reserve, you know, so other types of reserve. These patients have low reserve and it's a, a typical thing. We start off slow and it's nice and dry and beautiful and by the end of the operation we're in a, we're in a pool of blood um, because they just don't have any um, reserve to draw upon. Um, the, you know, there's now an increased effort to medicate them ahead of time um, to decrease um, blood loss and you know, tranexamic acid was talked about at the SRS um, this year and you know, Amicar and others and I think those all have um, utility. We just don't have enough universal experience to give guidelines. Everybody's trying their own little thing at their own place to see um, if it will impact. Um, pulmonary, um, this is a patient, I just I have a red arrow there to show you. Um, it's an issue, especially for um, the, the Duchenne patients. Once their PFTs decline to a certain amount, um, it's going to be difficult to get them off a respirator. And this is a patient that before didn't have that sign and after does, and amazingly is still happy about it, thinks it's the greatest thing, and even though now um, they have a trach. Um, the other issue with pulmonary, obviously, pneumonia, um, and we heard about you know, swallowing studies and G-tubes, and you know, get the patients ready um, before, before you um, operate on them. It's not, there's no rush. Um, you know, do your swallowing study, sort of, you know, make sure that they don't need to basically get diverted so they don't get their um, post-op aspiration and their pneumonia, and I'd get them, get them moving right away. Um, wound issues, again, loom large, um, especially in the spina bifida patients, but in most of the neuromusculars, because these are chronic disease, um, diseases. I mean, they, they're not just a spine deformity. Um, and and in, the, in, the, in the spina bifida patients, you've got the wound envelope issue, you've got the multiple, multiple operative site, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are also other issues, you know, cognition play, plays a role in this, um, the degree of overall involvement plays a role in this, the bladder plays a role in this. Um, neural function, um, it's nice when things don't work <clears throat> because then you can just take out the spinal cord and then you're done and it becomes like a, you know, like a spine, like a oxygen is perfect operation. You pull out all the vertebrae, you, you, you hook them on the rod, you put the rod back in and it looks great. Um, 
but this would be somebody I'd be worried about. This is my case. We worry about um, after the operation because I've significantly changed um, their um, posture, um, and I hope. And in this case, it was okay. But if he had significant contractions, I may not be such a you know you know such a macho man trying to make him perfectly straight because I may not make him better if he can't reach things that he could reach um, before. I think pseudoarthrosis. This is an area of controversy, an area of debate, and again, in the in the setting of an innovations um, conference, an area of maybe for innovation. Um, and I think this is where the pediatric guys differ somewhat from the adult guys. Um, you know, we use wimpy fixation for the pelvis, and I know the adult surgeons um, um, think, you know, how could you, how could you even think that this thing was going to fuse? Obviously, it's not fused because it means to disengage. How would you think that was ever going to fuse um, when you just use two skinny, sort of smooth metal rods? And now it's all about big bolts and you know, connectors upon connectors upon connectors and heavy metal upon heavy metal, and there's nowhere for the for, for the bone to go. Um, but I think, you know, I think we in the pediatric world have pretty good success with the, with the, Luke, with the Galveston um, technique. Um, this is a unit rod with the Toronto modification. Um, but every now and then, you know, you get a miss. Um, and so for me, I try to avoid it unless I have to. And some people have said that, um, you know, use walking as your indicator. If they walk, don't, don't include the pelvis. If they don't, include it. Um, that's just one, uh, that's one criterion. You know, other is obliquity, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for me, this guy, um, got a pseudoarthrosis. Um, you know, this guy I just avoided um, the pelvis. A much more functional, much, much more functional um, patient. Um, finally, a, a word about cost, um, and this is something we don't like to talk about too much um, because it brings in all these issues, all these painful issues like ethics and who makes the decisions and stuff. But we looked at our, um, our patients. Um, and divide them into idiopathic neuromusculars, and you can sort of see um, what, you, what you're up against, but certainly a 50% increase in cost in treating neuromusculars. So somewhere along the way, someone's going to have to start asking these questions, and, you know, should you be doing this? Just because you have a curve doesn't mean you have to absolutely operate on them. Um, another issue is that you can see in green, it's for the idiopathics. The, imp the idiopathics um, outdid the neuromusculars and implants because it's pedicle screw, pedicle screw, pedicle screw at every level, you know, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000. Um, whereas with the neuromusculars, we're doing a lot of wires and stuff. It's, again, wimpy fixation, but it works. Um, but now, increasingly, for the neuromusculars, everyone's using, you know, big time, um, you know, pedicle screw, arama. Um, and it's something to think about. It's, gonna, it's maybe going to tip the scale even more um, 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 against the neuromusculars. So the you know, treatment algorithm, um, this is sort of the standard stuff. Um, when do you brace? I don't think it really influences natural history, but it's sort of a, a put-off game. Um, when do you decide to intervene? You know, so I, I made it X degrees because it really depends. If they're really young, you're trying to delay and delay and delay. Um, on the other hand, if you have high-risk patients like the Duchennes, you want to you know, intervene sooner. So there's no, there's no number. There's no 45 or 50 as you would use for, for um, the idiopathics. Also, when you have sort of bad bone and you have your neural um, um, worries, you might want to intervene sooner. Um, if you do operate, you know, when do you do anterior? These are some of the things. You know, I wonder about the 10-year-old, you know, the early crankshaft. I, I've, heard, I've heard this today. Um, not everybody, no, everybody accepts crankshaft, um, and certainly the DuPonters wrote an article about neuromuscular patients, and the youngest patient was six, and none of them had a crankshaft with, um, with an every-level um, segmental fixation. It was, it was all wires. Um, and so I don't know if, if, if there's an absolute age when you'd want to go in the front, certainly if they're stiff, but then you have to ask yourself, you know, what's the, what's the goal? And you want to get them balanced, not necessarily straight. Um, obviously, if you see the 150 degree curve, that, that, that's, that's an extreme case. Um, but stiffness to me is a relative indication. But certainly if you don't have enough bone like a, a spina bifida or bad bone like a neurofibromatosis that may have an increased risk of pseudoarthrosis, you go in the front. And then whether you put the pelvis in or not, that's one criterion. I don't, I don't think you have to go with this, but some have said, you know, use that as, as, as a decider um, to include or spare the pelvis. Obviously, pelvic obliquity, et cetera, et cetera, um, is important too. Um, things that influence me, I think cognition really influences me. If the patient does not respond, um, I, I just don't intervene. Um, and I say that with some risk because that's, a, that's some, somewhat of a, a, you know, a quality judgment, um, not an absolute judgment. It's not a degree. It's not a this, it's not a that. Um, and, and then care, you know, the, lum the lumbar curves, you know, why, why do we even treat those? I mean, if they can care for themselves and sit okay, maybe we should just leave those alone. Um, so finally, if I can just philosophize, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges for me with the neuromusculars is, you know, how much to do for them because there's no end to operating on them. And it's not just their spine, it's their hip, it's their contractures, it's their foot, it's that, and, you know, and it's sort of they spend their whole life in a hospital. Um, but I think... Part of that is because this is sort of the way the surgeon views um, his patients. And this is, I just made this up, and I gave it a fancy Latin word, uh, term just to make it 
uh, more credible. But you know, I used to, when I was a, uh, a, a resident, I used to always talk about the pie. It's a fixed pie. You know, it's a fixed pie of money. It's a fixed pie of resources, um, and it's sort of a fixed pie, sort of world. You know, your life view. And I think we see the world like this. Like we are just so important in this patient. If we just fix that spine, this patient is just going to be great, and we're going to do everything in the world, and we're going to just going to cut the spine out and put it back in and make him perfect. But I think this is the way the the patient sees the world, all right? And we're just a small slice. Um, and so I would just say, go slow with the neuromusculars. They don't all have to be treated. And maybe just do what you need to do, not these, you know, real big extravaganzas. And they're probably not going to be any worse off than if you had done more. Thanks. So basically, uh, we know now that uh, the incidence of uh, neuroelement lesions varies uh, in uh, in, uh, in patients, especially when you uh, consider uh, the age groups, uh, and you can see that uh, as you go uh, towards adolescence, the incidence will decrease, and uh, patients with uh, congenital or uh, infantile scoliosis, they have uh, a higher chance of uh, having neuromental lesions, and uh, those uh, rates can uh, go up to uh, 40 or 50 uh, percent. Uh, in certain, uh, if you read some papers and uh, consider some age groups. Uh, and the most common lesions we see are uh, carry malformations, uh, type 1, uh, associated with, or not with uh, syringomyelia. Some patients will have carry 1. Uh, less commonly, uh, patients will have uh, split cord malformations, uh, either type 1 or type 2, although type 2 is now uh, seen more uh, commonly. Uh, patients who have a uh, tethered cord, especially uh, patients with uh, myelomeningocele, and also uh, less commonly intramedullary tumors and uh, brain stem tumors. Patients who present with symptoms of uh, head or neck pain, ataxia, muscle weakness, uh, cave was deformity of the foot, especially associated with tethered cord. Uh, several authors have pointed out that absent abdominal reflex uh, is a very valuable uh, sign in determining if there's a if this, that's not a uh, case of uh, idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, patients that present with a severe curve despite immaturity. Uh, patients who present with uh, thoracic pain or back pain. Patients who have an asymmetric neurologic exam, just uh, sometimes you see an asymmetric uh, knee reflex or ankle reflex. A few patients will have a uh, few bits of clonus. Uh, also patients who present with uh, left thoracic curves especially greater than 20 degrees in uh, infantile or juvenile uh, patients. So what's the data pointing to uh, a rationale for treating the neuroelement lesions before correcting the scoliosis? Well, from the neurosurgical literature, it's very clear that intramedullary tumors and uh, brainstem tumors should be treated first. Uh, and cure actually may be possible, especially with uh, ependymomas. Uh, but the major thing is uh, patients who tend to have uh, scoliosis associated with the intramedullary tumors usually have a holocord tumor, and uh, it's usually an astrocytoma. And, uh, you know, to gross resection is not always possible. Uh, and uh, also, some tumors, they tend to, uh, you know, destroy the uh, motor neuron cells of the the anterior horn cells, and, uh, and then you have a lot of uh, atrophy of the sometimes paraspinal muscles, and also uh, that influences the uh, progression of the curve as well. Uh, patients with uh, split cord malformations, we know now that these patients will have a tethered cord, and uh, during the growth spurt, they may actually present with uh, neurological deterioration. Also, that's the same for uh, patients with uh, myelomeningocele, uh, that the tethering of the cord is especially valuable. And uh, we know now that tethering of the cord causes uh, ischemia in the watershed zone during the growth spurt, and uh, that's why you have to detether the cord or, or cut a thickened phylum to uh, allow the core to uh, ascend during the growth period. Patients with uh, syringomyelia and Chiari malformations, uh, also we know that these patients will uh, progress and have a neurological deterioration uh, once they start having symptoms. And uh, 
Suboccipital decompression now is very effective in uh, reducing the syrinx cavity, and uh, most patients can actually, uh, you can actually arrest uh, uh, the, the neurological disease and uh, sometimes obtain improvement in a neurological function. But what is the question of uh, arrest curve progression with a neurosurgical procedure? Well, in, we know that myelomeningocele patients, they often have a uh, tethered cord and they will, will often progress to have a kyphoscoliosis. And uh, several studies, especially from uh, Ozer de Moglu, have shown that patients who have myelomeningocele and scoliosis, if you, can, if you detether cord before they have a 40 degree curve, you can have some uh, arrest in the curve progression. But he noticed that patients who have curves which are more than 40 degrees, or patients who initially presented with a thoracic myelomeningocele, those patients will have uh, curve progression despite uh, no matter what you do. What about correcting scoliosis uh, in patients with uh, syringomyelia or split cord, cord malformations. Well, there is uh, some series that show that there's up to 5% risk of uh, neurological deterioration when you uh, do a scoliosis correction, especially if patients have a large syrinx. Uh, and then uh, this, in one way, led to uh, you know, more investigations on uh, underlying causes of uh, scoliosis in a few patients, and, uh, but then uh, as more patients were being identified to uh, have uh, syringomyelia associated with scoliosis and uh, more observational studies were done, then some studies later on showed that, you know, patients who have almost normal neurologic examination or patients who have been relatively stable for the past few months, few months or uh, they can actually be operated on and have their scoliosis corrected quite safely, especially if you have good interoperative neurological, uh, neurophysiological monitoring, uh, especially now with uh, evoked motor potentials and also uh, SICPs. So the largest uh, uh, population of patients who have scoliosis and neuroelement lesions really falls into uh, patients with uh, KRE1 and the uh, syringomyelia. So uh, what if a patient has only a syrinx not associated with KRE? Well, that's a difficult problem to treat. And uh, we from neurosurgery, you know that syringomyelia, it's, it's not an easy uh, entity to uh, treat actually. You know, most patients will have uh, arachnoiditis, which makes a syringo subarachnoid shunt uh, less likely to work. And uh, some patients will have uh, tumors associated with syrinx, and you actually can remove the, the, the tumor quite well, but still uh, the syrinx can develop later on because of uh, arachnoiditis. Uh, and uh, the other options are really uh, syringopleural shunt or syringoperitoneal shunt. But we, we from uh, we analyzing the neurosurgical literature, we see that in the long term, we cannot get very good results for uh, shunting of syrinxes. Uh, it may be related to uh, there's not a lot of uh, a gradient between the intramedullary pressures and uh, the abdominal pressures, and uh, therefore there's not a lot of uh, diversion of CSF. Lots of papers have shown that if you shunt a syrinx, uh, there's a very low chance of uh, having an arrest of curve progression on the long term, and that's probably related to the uh, uh, not good results uh, actually in achieving a good treatment of the uh, syrinx cavity uh, itself. But for patients who have a Chiari 1 associated with uh, syringomyelia, we know that posterior fossa decompression is quite effective in, uh, in decreasing the size of uh, the syrinx. And actually, many patients will have their appearance of the syrinx, or they'll have uh, neurological uh, benefit from it. And the major question is, well, I wonder if we do that surgery in patients with scoliosis, uh, 
Is there a chance that uh, we can arrest this, uh, this curve progression? Well, several papers now have shown that if patients are younger than 10 years of age and they have a curve that's uh, no greater than 30 degrees, actually uh, we have some data that a posterior fossa decompression can actually be effective in uh, arresting the uh, progression of that curve. And uh, on the other hand, if patients are older than 10 and have curves which are larger than 40 degrees, uh, really the posterior fossa decompression won't do, uh, won't do anything for the curve itself, although you get uh, some neurological benefit. Uh, but interestingly, if you analyze those papers carefully, you will see that most of the patients that had some arrest of curve progression were not really followed until they reached uh, skeletal maturity. Even though they showed some, uh, they had some benefit for those patients, we still need uh, we still need more uh, long-term results and uh, longer follow-up for those patients, uh, probably until they pass the uh, skeletal maturity age. So in conclusions, uh, neuromental lesions are common in patients with uh, scoliosis, especially in uh, younger age groups. Uh, tumors of the neuroaxis should be uh, treated first, uh, especially intramedullary tumors. And very rarely, you know, uh, patients with brain tumors, brainstem tumors will present with uh, scoliosis. Young patients with uh, carry malformations, they ha may have some arrest of curve progression, uh, especially if they're young, but we still need more uh, long-term results. In patients with large curves, more than, for, uh, more than uh, 40 degrees, uh, they'll most likely need uh, fusion despite uh, any neurosurgical treatment you offer for that entity. Thank you. Thank you.